I'm Ann Lounsbury. I'm the chair of the Department of Russian Islamic Studies down the hall. And I'm extremely pleased to be able to introduce Professor Dotsitinovska, who's visiting us from the University of Oxford. Um, uh, Professor Dotsitinovska specializes in political anthropology, focusing on geopolitics <laughs> and mobility, which is extremely interesting to us today, forms of statehood, sovereignty, and capitalism, and um, in, in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, and post-socialism as a critical lens for analysis of late liberalism. Um, her, her master's and doctoral degrees are from University of California, Berkeley, and also from NYU, what used to be called the Draper School. So she's an alumna as well. And we are extremely happy that she's going to be talking to us, I think, on uh, material related to your first book, right? Yes. To the book School of European Nets Tolerance and Other Lessons in Political Liberalism in Latvia. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you very much, Anne, for introducing me and for inviting me. I'm really um, very happy to be here. And indeed, I've been talking to some of you today about um, immigration and emptiness, but the talk will be on the project preceding that. Um, one that actually led to the current research on emptiness and immigration, but this one is on political liberalism, or actually existing political liberalism in Latvia. And it will be probably not no news to you if I begin by saying that something consequential is happening with liberalism. Today, governing elites in Western liberal democracies are concerned with the risks posed by a variety of illiberal populisms at home, and Russia and China abroad. To make sense of liberalism's current predicament, some academics, such as Ivan Krastev, among others, invite reflection on liberalism's internal failures that have contributed to political crisis in Western liberal democracy. Others point to the failures of aspiring or not yet liberal subjects. For example, in the so-called, in the midst of so-called Europe's migration crisis, an Oxford colleague lamented that Eastern Europeans have learned to be good neoliberals, but have not received or are failing in lessons in political liberalism. Liberalism, then, is once a meta-category of Western political discourse, as Duncan Bell has noted, a complex political tradition and a hegemonic political order that may or may not be embattled today. Its core is elusive, and its economic and political trajectories tend to be treated separately. Indeed, much of critical reflection about liberalism's internal failures pertains to political, illiberal, li political liberalism's inability to deal with the negative consequences of economic globalization, such as inequality, poverty, and other forms of dispossession. More than that, contemporary liberalism's economic strand, commonly referred to as neoliberalism, um, has been criticized for quite some time, especially in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, where states and societies were subjected to the so-called shock therapy. But this has not undermined its global strength. In anthropology, it could be said that neoliberalism has become an unqualified dark force, to use Sherry Ordner's terms, a foil against which to mount one's analytical and political intervention. A number of colleagues have argued that anthropology, and I think it could be said for other disciplines as well, tends to be concerned with neoliberalism without confronting it directly, that is, distinguishing among its constitutive elements and examining the various historical configurations in which they are found. The fate of political liberalism in social sciences literature on Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union has been different. While there has been some critical engagements, with how concepts such as civil society travel, political liberalism, unlike neoliberalism, is not a common object of critique. And I find this to be noteworthy, especially as there is so much, or there's considerable uh, the amount of works written um, across disciplines about liberalism's limits, both in theory and in practice. For example, about its qualified conceptions of freedom in colonial and post-colonial contexts, there are ethnographies of liberalization projects that have aimed to make citizens out of colonial subjects while continuously deferring their political maturity and therefore full citizenship. And there are ethnographies of liberal politics of recognition, for example in Australia, that require the aboriginal subject to remain other in order to be granted recognition. 
And there are ethnographies of secularism in Egypt or in France that claim that the liberal distinction between religion and secularism cannot accommodate Islam, for example. In all of these ethnographies, liberalism emerges as a civilizational, even a missionary project that governs and disciplines um, difference according to enlightenment hierarchies of people in places. Now, in these works, liberalism is not the highest form of human government. Rather, it is a form of government posited as the highest form of government by a particular historical community that was to remain the world in their image. Political liberalization projects in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union have not been scrutinized in this way. In conditions when collapse and delegitimization of socialism has left the ideological field rather thin, it seems too dangerous to criticize political liberalism because of the risk of reappearance of all kinds of monsters, and many, of course, argue that they already have reappeared in the form of illiberal populism. From this perspective, parts of Eastern Europe appear as bellwethers of global dangers, and Eastern Europe itself appears as a place where political liberalism never quite took root. This is not uniform across Eastern Europe. Of course, the Baltics have suddenly become quite liberal insofar as a transnational coalition involving Eastern European nationalists and North Atlantic strategists associate the Baltic states with the frontier of the so-called international liberal order. And I'll return to this point later. At the same time, when one looks at liberal political virtues, such as openness towards others, including refugees, the Baltics too are often found lacking. They've, this played out quite clearly in the context of the 2005 migration refugee crisis, and I sort of use it in quotation marks because that term is contested, what, what kind of a crisis it was, or whether it was a crisis at all. Um, and in the context of, of this crisis, this generated a stark and moralized juxtaposition between Eastern and Western Europe among scholars and pundits, and that was all sort of already exemplified in, in the in the, in the statement of my colleague who quickly sorted out that Eastern Europeans failed lessons in political liberalism. This quick moral sorting of Eastern and Western Europe shows just how powerful entrenched markers of Europeanness are and how quickly people and places are evaluated against ideal type models and moral codes. However, in order to understand the post-Cold War political landscape in Eastern Europe and the Euro-Atlantic world more generally, it is not sufficient to evaluate people and places from the vantage point of an ideal type of political liberalism, whatever that may be. Rather, one needs to look at the constitutive elements and multiple versions of the post-Cold War liberalism. And here I join political theorists such as John Gray and Jan Zelonka, who argue that contemporary forms of liberalism require closer scrutiny. John Gray, for example, has been particularly concerned with what he terms hyper-liberalism, or even <coughs> alt-liberalism most recently, that is a dogmatic form of liberalism that tries to get rid of alternative worldviews by limiting <coughs> freedom of speech. <coughs> Jan Zelonka argues that liberalism has become what he calls an ideology of power, unable to deal with human <coughs> embeddedness in cultural and historical communities, among other things. Both raise the question whether the hegemonic form of power today that considers itself to be in battle is liberalism at all, and it is important that it is both hegemonic and perceives itself to be in battle, um, and both Zelenka and Gray conclude that liberalism is varied and changing and that what is needed is critical analysis of its currently institutionalized <laughs> forms. So this is the vantage point from which I will speak today about the actually existing post-Cold War liberalism, political liberalism in Latvia. And you may recognize that I'm bor borrowing the formulation actually existing from another historical moment and from another ism, namely socialism, as you know. The term actually existing socialism or real socialism first appeared in the Soviet Union after Stalin's death and marked the end of striving towards communism. Real socialism was what the Soviet Union was, and it was not to be measured against the promised ideal. In other words, it was a term used by Soviet authorities to describe themselves and the society they presided over. Western leftists picked up this term, but used it for slightly different purposes. They retained the idea <coughs> of and the hope for ideal socialism and used the term actually existing socialism to measure the distance between the ideal and the Soviet Eastern European reality. Now, in borrowing this formulation to describe post-Cold War liberalism, I'm neither affirming nor denying ideal liberalism, rather I'm distinguishing practices and actors 
that claimed to be liberal in Eastern Europe and are recognized or were recognized by others as liberal from liberalism as a theory. And I'm going to be talking today about the contested project of remaking people's hearts and minds in the name of political liberalism that took shape in the context of post-socialist transition and European integration in Latvia. The contours of the actually existing post-Cold War political liberalism come to view, into view most clearly at the time of its encounter with people and places that were thought to have lost way as a result of living under actually existing socialism. These liberalization encounters reveal the underlying tension of Europe's political landscape, and I refer to this tension as the paradox of Europeanness. The paradox of Europeanness is best characterized as the need to draw a variety of boundaries around liberal democratic states, polities, and selves, while emphasizing the virtues of inclusion, openness, and tolerance. And thus, in 2005, I began fieldwork on attempts to embed the liberal political virtue of tolerance in public institutions and the hearts and, mind, and, hearts and minds of individuals with the help of an official government program called the National Program for the, Motion, for the Promotion of Tolerance. At that time, neoliberalization of the economy and other spheres of life was in full swing in Latvia. The Latvian version of the post-Soviet and many would argue corrupt capitalism had produced a huge credit-based economic bubble. Latvian residents were urged to author their own economic lives. The speed with which political liberalism was making its way into public institutions and the hearts and minds of individuals was much slower. Local liberals often attributed this to the difficulty of changing the collectivist mentality characteristic of both socialism and nationalism. And indeed, most Latvians, officially regarded as the state-carrying people, did not want to give up their collective sense of self and insisted on the need to protect and cultivate the embattled nation, so the nation also considered itself to be embattled, alongside individual liberties and respect for diversity. The tension between the collective and the individual is, of course, not unique to Latvia. In fact, this tension is built into the modern European nation state. But the liberalization encounter specifically identified Latvian and Eastern European collectivism as a pathological phenomenon. In Latvia, the paradox of Europeanness manifested <coughs> itself as an attempt to entrench the state-carrying nation and secure national and European borders while simultaneously engaging with the ethical and political claims of others that is, those who may have been part of the polity, but were or felt excluded from the nation at the foundation of the state. In the public space, these others were usually identified vis-a-vis -vis recognized categories of diversity, such as ethnicity, race, sexuality, and religion. Now, this diversity was distinct from unpalatable difference, which was attributed to those Russian speakers who made claims for the state rather than minority claims within it. And, it. and it is actually in response to this unpalatable difference that the Latvian parliament introduced a preamble to the Latvian constitution in 2014, which states that the primary purpose of the Latvian state is to ensure the continuity and flourishing of the Latvian cultural nation, while also protecting individual rights of its citizens. And I can speak to this more um, later. Since no other competing political ideologies were available, and since the geopolitical orientation westward was beyond doubt, attending to the claims of others, that is, to the legitimate claims of others rather than the unpalatable difference, was to be achieved by institutionalizing and internalizing the liberal politics of difference and associated political virtues such as tolerance. It was both a requirement for EU accession and a civilizing project. The liberal politics of difference, however, were not recognizable to the Latvian and Russian-speaking publics. Many people did not link tolerance with identity or politically recognized categories of diversity. In countless seminars and discussions on tolerance held as part of the program activities, participants insisted that it doesn't matter to them who people are, but rather what they do. That is, that it is actions rather than identities that should be the object of tolerance. They also thought, that is the participants of these seminars, they also thought that tolerance was already part of everyday life, that to live was to continuously negotiate with others, 
that is to be tolerant until such negotiations were no longer possible because a threshold of tolerance had been reached. According to this logic, intolerance could be as virtuous as tolerance, or more so, for it meant rising up against injustice. These discussions showed that promoting tolerance as a liberal political virtue required that Latvia's residents rework their understanding of tolerance from a social virtue that had always been part of social life into a political virtue that had to be cultivated as a positive way of relating to politically and publicly recognized and equivalent categories of diversity. Many Latvians were puzzled. If social life could not but be a life of negotiation and compromise or putting up with disagreeable practices that were not consequential for one's ability to go on with life, political life, especially that of the nation, was not to be a life of compromise but rather of self-determination. As self-identified members of the cultural nation of Latvians and as formal members of the Latvian polity, Many of those targeted by the tolerance promotion efforts argued that Latvians as a nation have been putting up with all kinds of things for centuries, referring here to the domination of Baltic German landlords, Russian imperial administrators, and the Soviet state, and that it was time to straighten the national backbone. They thought that by gaining independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Latvians had achieved the political right to determine how they were to live and whom they were to live with. But there were also true believers among Latvia's residents, that is, individuals who were not only convinced that political liberalism offered, offered the best model for living together across difference, but who also tried to convince others that this was so. Many of my interlocutors, or tolerant workers as I refer to them, belonged in this category. They were part of a network of civil servants, NGO workers, international consultants and activists, and were all engaged in efforts to promote tolerance as a public and political virtue. Some of them were returned second generation diaspora Latvians who had grown up in the West during the Cold War. Others were locals who had embraced liberal values as a result of education abroad, life experience, or combination of both. And others yet were minorities, African Latvians, Jews, Roma, LGBT people, Russians, who found in liberalism a framework for their political projects. Using conventional anthropological terminology, one might say this was my tribe. Some members of this tribe spoke about belonging to a community of understanding in contrast to an ethnic group or a place-based community, but there were also significant tensions within this group. For example, some members thought that other members were not liberal enough. Those who did not claim any particular minority identity, but rather thought of themselves as pure liberals, tended to point out that some of the members of the Jewish community were racist, and that most of the members of the African Latvian Association were homophobic. But generally, they did recognize each other as members of the same ideologically connected network. There were also young people among them, individuals who were coming of age during post-socialist transition. transition. When many of them developed a sense of self, vis-a-vis -vis liberal values felt passionately about them and were truly embarrassed and pained by their compatriots' reluctance to embrace liberal political virtues. They invested their hopes and futures in Europe as a liberal political and moral community. So my fieldwork began as an investigation of how these tolerance workers attempt, attempted to convince the Latvian public that there was a widespread problem of intolerance in the Latvian society, and subsequently to reorient public attitudes to embrace the virtue of tolerance. But as I looked deeper into this, I realized that tolerance promotion was one element of a much bigger project of transformation. It was a comprehensive, rather than a procedural, as John Rawls would have it, remaking of how people, individually and collectively, imagined and des described and enacted their place in the world and their relations with others. And it is this project of transformation that I think best illuminates the constitutive <coughs> elements of the actually existing post cold War political liberalism. In addition to implementing new legislation, it required that people revaluate and revise first how they think about themselves and their relations with others, 
Second, how they think about and draw boundaries between their community and others. And third, how they see their place in the world historically and today. And I ended up addressing each of these dimensions as they manifested themselves in different sites and through different encounters, from politics of asylum and migration to discussions about history, from minority rights to language use, from critical thinking to knowledge production. Ultimately, it became apparent that the actually existing post-Cold War political liberalism was constituted via demands that people rethink their relations with power. That is, that they distance themselves from power and look critically at, at it. Power, vara or blast, here was primarily understood as submission to socialist or nationalist collectivism. Time and again, my interlocutors, the tolerance workers, insisted that most Latvians do not recognize their entanglement with power, lack critical thinking, and do not practice individual reflection. This stands backfired, however, because the liberal tolerance workers did not acknowledge their own entanglement with power and ideology. That is, they did not recognize that post-Cold War political liberalism was becoming a form of collectivism. Their target audience, the liberal Latvians, especially the last Soviet generation, found it odd that the tolerance workers insisted on being agents of freedom and democracy when their demands to change public conduct and ways of thinking seemed quite similar to those of their Soviet predecessors. Some claimed that it was the tolerance workers who had internalized power and were unable to establish critical distance from it rather than the intolerant Latvians, who remained suspicious of those who claimed distance from power and ideology. And this clash of perceptions was particularly evident in debates about language, to which I now turn. For Latvian language speakers and experts, collapse of the Soviet Union meant that language was freed from power in a double sense. First, external constraints of the Soviet state were removed. And second, the legitimacy of the Russian language as the dominant language was over, and the work of closing began. The use of the word Zhids, meaning Jew or Zhid in Russian, is a good example of how this played out. Following Russian imperial practices, the Soviet state legislated the use of Ebrace instead of Zhids with a decree issued by the People's Commissar for Education on September 14, 1940. Prior to that, the word had been used in official discourse and in literature, its etymology being traced to, the, to German Jude, with J becoming J in Latvian. And here is a publication of the post-World uh, War II Latvian Jewish Association of Freedom Fighters that uses the word Jids. With Ebrace being used in official discourse, so you see the, the, uh, the, exactly the, the Latvian freedom fighters of Jewish nationality, that's what it says in Latvian. With Ebrace being used in official discourse and Zhids in private conversations for much of the Soviet period, the word Zhids resurfaced in public discourse after the collapse of the Soviet Union. According to Raimond's Briedis study of censorship in Soviet Latvia, most instances of censorship were contextual and unpredictable, but words such as kungs, kunza, gentleman, lady, dievs, god, and Zhids, Jews, were consistently removed. The absence of these words became symbolic of censorship and the words themselves nearly sacred. The removal of external constraints that crippled authentic language in the, in the view of, of Latvian uh, language speakers was thought to equal freedom. Tolerance workers thought this, this was a misguided understanding of freedom and took the use of the word sheets to be an important indicator of the lack of tolerant sensibilities within the Latvian speaking public. In addition to the word Zhids, tolerance workers also found it unacceptable that Latvian and Russian, that Latvian and Russian speakers both used the word Nederis or Negr to refer to dark-skinned people of African origin. Tolerance workers demanded that the Latvian public rethink its naming practices and revise its understanding of where the legitimacy of such practices comes from, language as a historical formation or ethical appeals of proximate <coughs> and distant <coughs> others. For many speakers of Latvian, it was various external actors, including the minorities and homegrown liberals, who were mistranslating these words as injurious because they brought spatially or temporally distant social and political contexts to bear upon the original meaning of the sign. Some Latvian language experts claimed that the two words seemed injurious as a result of occupation and globalization. In the case of Zhids, 
Russian language and its dominant status in relation to Latvian was blamed for tainting the Latvian proper name for Jews with derogatory meaning. And the Soviet occupation was blamed for the arrival of Russian Jews who did not understand the world's historical meaning in the Latvian language, and there were not many Latvian Jews to, left to tell them otherwise. In the case of Nederis, it was the term's history in the context of American slavery and its use in English that was thought to taint the Latvian one. If cleared from external impositions of meaning, Latvian language experts argued these words were linguistically correct and historically innocent. In order to change linguistic and ethical conduct, tolerance promoters organized seminars and discussions for various target groups, for example teachers, to which they invited minority representatives. Some representatives of the Jewish community in Latvia acknowledged Latvian claims to historical injury, but appealed to ethics of cohabitation to convince Latvians to use the word ebreis instead of jids. Other minority representatives refused to participate in such renaming rituals. For example, in a seminar I observed in 2005, the Roma representative skillfully avoided answering the moderator's question about whether he would like to be called a gypsy in Roma until the moderator actually forced uh, the person to go one way or another. Today, the word jids has disappeared from public discourse, though it continues to appear in private conversations. This is quite similar to what happened during the Soviet period. And it is hard to tell to what extent members of the Latvian public heard the ethical appeal of the Jewish community and remade themselves accordingly, and to what extent the purging of the word from public life was an outcome of a re-civilizing process that, not unlike during the Soviet period, resulted in the standardization of public discourse and privatization of publicly scorned usages. In the mid-2000s, many Latvians thought that tolerance workers were engaged in a form of censorship similar to that practiced by the Soviet state. Tolerance workers, of course, did not think that they were engaged in censorship, which they, like most members of the Latvian public, associated with totalitarian states and considered to be an immoral practice. For them, public regulation of language was an ethical practice that helped create good liberal subjects and a liberal public sphere. They were not, that is the tolerance workers, they were not primarily concerned with law, but rather with members of the public who claimed to simply speak Latvian when they were, in fact, in the view of tolerance workers, exhibiting intolerance of, in language. Tolerance workers wanted to purge intolerant language, but they also wanted to make a liberal public that would fulfill the watchdog function. For them, most Latvians were unable to make a transition from censorship understood as external and immoral, to censorship understood as internal and virtuous, which is to say, from censorship to self-control. Let us move to the second, to the second dimension of the liberal project of total social transformation, namely the bounding and bordering of communities and territories while professing adherence to the virtues of openness and inclusion. It is most visible in the overlapping debates on migration and minority politics. My first example refers to Latvia's Russian speakers, which includes Russians and Russian-speaking Ukrainians, Belarusians, and others who tend to be sorted by the Latvian state and by Latvians as the state-bearing people into national minorities on the one hand and Soviet migrants on the other. And here you can see uh, a poster from an exhibit developed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 2005 which was taken to Brussels as an attempt to explain the difference between national minorities and migrants. Um, and so migrants here are depicted as economic migrants, as mishochniki, or people who come sort of with, with bags, arrive uh, with bags uh, by train, for whom attachment to place is insignificant. So that was kind of the idea that this is how the Soviet era migrants arrived. And you can give another picture where people are lined up by the store and sort of um, as if, you know, to, to, to illustrate the economic um, um, reasoning for their, for their movement. So back then already this was constructed, the economic migration was constructed as negative. My second example has to do with the more recent debates about migration, namely the politics of asylum seeking and the problem of distinguishing between deserving refugees from, again, undeserving economic migrants. The first case pertains to historical others, or rather historically proximate others, the second to so-called new others. In both cases, some others end up being included 
thus in a way demonstrating commitment to an inclusive and open society, and other others uh, are excluded mostly on the grounds of their own misconduct, as I will try to show. For example, when sorting Russian-speaking former Soviet citizens into national minorities and migrants, the Latvian state does not draw the line on the grounds of citizenship, but rather conduct. All those who behave like national minorities, rather than subjects who challenge the Latvian state as a national state, can avail themselves of the rights granted to national minorities within the framework of the Latvian legislation and European conventions. This means that even those Russian speakers who may not be Latvian citizens because they arrived during the Soviet period and have not, um, have not naturalized, therefore, and therefore actually do not legally qualify as national minorities, even they may publicly appear as legitimate, mem as legitimate members of a national minority. And this is how that is understood. This is how uh, Russian speakers and other minorities can appear as legitimate members of national minority, that is, as, as as a cultural as a cultural group that engages and practices its own cultural activities, and this is how they are imagined as illegitimate uh, present in a public space. This is a photo from a, one of the um, uh, celebrations of the Victory Day, May 9th, May 8th, and 9th. That's actually two, both days are celebrated, and this is a, this is the sort of unpalatable difference uh, for it is understood to be making claims for the state and not minority claims with it. Let me illustrate with the case of women belonging to the Tatar Cultural Association, whom I visited during my field work during mid 2000s. These women um, who had become part of this organization hadn't known each other during the Soviet period when they had lived public lives as Soviet citizens without a publicly or even privately enacted ethnic affiliation. In the post-Soviet period, when the legitimacy of their public presence was eroded, and along with it a much valued sense of sociality, they had found each other as fellow ethnics through various accidental encounters in the dentist's office or through, through various uh, friends. And during my visits to their meetings, they practiced uh, for a, a national minority cultural festival and they sang along with folk songs blasting from a karaoke machine sent from Kazan in preparation for this national minority festival. But their resentment about it being expelled from public space as citizens while allowed back in as a national minority was never far from the surface. And the post-Latvian public didn't recognize their personal wars, and they themselves didn't recognize themselves in addresses to the public. They didn't sort of hear themselves in the address of the state. They didn't uh, feel interpolated by it. Instead, some of them felt offended by the designation occupiers, which radical nationalist organizations and actually parts of the Latvian public used to refer not only to the Soviet state, but also to, also to Soviet era incomers. And this disjuncture was entirely new to them. Um, during the Soviet period, they had quite unreflectively inhabited the public space as their own. In other words, they did not feel alienated from public space, didn't even think about it much. And now they could only inhabit it as citizens if they recognized, in theory and in practice, the national nature of the state, learned the Latvian language, and applied for citizenship. Citizenship policies required that they remake themselves into deserving individuals and distance themselves from the mass of former Soviet migrants. Now, if they couldn't do that, then they were offered this other ambiguous national minority slot which provided some uh, opportunity to forge a community and to appear in public space, even though uh, they were continued to be resentful. The other more recent debate on refugees versus migrants has to do with the physical borders of the Latvian state, which are also external borders of the European Union. Here, becoming European meant that Latvian state officials, border guards in particular, had to learn to simultaneously securitize and civilize the border. Securitize is actually the term used by European Union institutions to talk, talk about border practices. Which meant that they had to make the border impenetrable for unwanted goods and people, but to do so kindly and while observing the human rights of border crossers. Um, and this is the fence that was just recently completed on the Latvian Russian border, I took this photo this summer as I'm currently working on border guards and the politics of border infrastructure. And the reason that I ended up working with the border guards in the first place is that uh, my int primary interlocutors, the, the tolerance workers, considered asylum seekers to be um, objects of tolerance par excellence and thus an ideal ground 
for extending liberalization process not only to the hearts and minds of the public, but also to institutions. So I, I sort of got to the border guards through the tolerance workers' activities in relation to asylum seekers. And back in the mid-2000s, the border guards with whom I worked were puzzled by this demand to simultaneously securitize and civilize the border. At first, they thought that these demands were irreconcilable. One border guard told me that Europeans didn't understand that they were trying to do the impossible by securing borders and observing human rights. But eventually, they learned as they underwent considerable amount of training under various European Union training arrangements. A particularly dramatic lesson was provided by an asylum case that erupted into Latvian public sphere in 2005, just as I was beginning my field work. And the whole migration apparatus of Latvia was thrown into disarray when seven alleged Somalis appeared as if out of nowhere, without any papers and speaking Amharic rather than Somali, yet insisting that they were Somalis. State institutions, including the border guard, tried to get to the bottom of the case in order to figure out who these people were, and whether they fell on the deserving or the undeserving side of the divide. The human rights organization, there was one in particular that worked on these issues, and I refer to it generally as the kind of generic terms as the human rights organization, uh, was convinced that the Latvian border guards were falling behind their Western European counterparts with regard to observing human rights norms due to backward attitudes. By demanding that the border guards supplement the performance of their border protection duties with observing human rights norms and behaving in a civilized manner, the human rights organization performed a crucial role in enacting the paradox of Europeanness on the border. And in the process, representatives of both institutions came to see themselves as belonging to opposite camps. Border guards thought that the human rights representatives, uh, uh, that the representatives of the human rights organization um, were out uh, to accuse all civil servants of, of human rights abuses, uh, and the border guards, uh, the, that is, the border guards thought that the human rights organization was out to uh, get all civil servants, while the human rights organization thought that the border guard was populated by unenlightened and prejudiced individuals. What also became apparent to the border guards, and I have to say that the files that I looked through this uh, actually confirm this is that uh, the European human rights institutions were, were concerned with some rights more than others. The human rights activists who monitored border guards operated within the framework of EU-funded projects concerned with rights of asylum seekers. But at the time of my fieldwork, there were more of what the border guards referred to as bombs of Soviet Kreisvazhdenia, or bombs of Soviet origin, that is socially marginal subjects with Soviet passports and Soviet life trajectories. So there were more of these kind of people on their radar screen than refugees. And this means that, uh, that, uh, that there were quite a few people on Latvian territory, and this was Russians, Georgians, Ukrainians, also some Latvians, who had failed to sort out their documents when political regimes changed and had ended up as illegal migrants without necessarily having moved, and they were actually populating these illegal immigration detention centers. <coughs> um, and the border guards struggled with this uneven distribution of attention. Some thought that the state ought to have paid more attention to these proximate others, as well as to the underpaid Latvians, including some border guards who were slowly but steadily leaving the country to go work in the UK and other Western European countries. And it seemed strange to the border guards that attention and resources were being dedicated to some asylum seekers when the Latvian towns and villages were emptying of people and falling into decay. And this is one of the reasons why my current work, uh, in my current work I have turned to emigration and also to immigration to the UK, as well as to emptiness as a particular way of living capitalism and freedom in the Latvian countryside. Now the tolerance workers dismissed such comments, the border guards' comments, as whataboutism. They argued that there should not be hierarchies of rights, that the asylum seekers' rights were not any less significant because some other people's rights had not been attended to. And in their view, <coughs> attempts to distinguish between proximate and distant others for the purposes of redirecting scarce resources were manifestations of inconsistency in the sphere of rights and therefore proof of lack of liberal virtues among border guards. This argument on the part of tolerance workers, however, reinforced the suspicion that tolerance workers were unaware of their own entanglement with power and ideology. They, to the border guards, they, it seemed that the tolerance workers insisted on inequality of rights in the face of obvious hierarchies. 
The border guards, in turn, failed to see that becoming European required that they extend their concern and sympathy beyond proximate others, that is, beyond Bon Jesus, West Virginia, and turn their attention to Europe's former colonial subjects as well. And insofar as they failed to do so, they were deemed to lack in Europeanness. And this brings me to the last dimension of the landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, to the, uh, the last dimension of the landscape of actually existing post-Cold War political liberalism that I want to describe today, namely the way Latvians understand and relate to history, their own and European, and just one small element of that. Tolerance workers thought that negative attitudes towards various others were problematic, but the fact that the majority of Latvia's residents did not see them as problematic was an even bigger problem. Most agreed that this had to do with the widespread lack of critical public reflection. For tolerance promoters, becoming tolerant, liberal, and European meant continuously engaging in critical public reflection. For the politicians and members of the public who were reluctant to publicly recognize the problem of intolerance, critical public reflection on the problem of intolerance meant tearing themselves down when they should be building themselves up. In other words, they thought that continuous self-criticism risked confirming what Europe already knew, namely that Eastern Europeans, including Latvians, were mired in nationalist and socialist legacies and thus not really European. They thought that Latvians needed to assert themselves to be European, but they missed the point, uh, in a sense, insofar as liberal Europe demanded a degree of self-destruction as part of becoming fully European. Within the prevailing European political and moral landscape, being and becoming European meant continuously and critically reflecting on the stains in European history, such as colonialism and fascism, and their legacies in the present, such as racism and intolerance. But for Latvian Latvians as a place and people in Europe, but not quite European, public, public reflection on past sins and present blemishes seemed to postpone rather than speed up full admission. Let me illustrate with a brief consideration of the scholarly and popular histories of the colonial pursuits of the 17th century Duchy of Courland, a vassal state to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth located in current day Latvian territory. Duke Jacob of Courland attempted to obtain colonies in order to participate in the Atlantic Triangle trade. For a period of 10 years, he succeeded in holding on to the island of Tobago and parts of western Gambia. He was also famous for his naval fleet, which was another way of proving his Europeanness according to the criteria of the day. Duke Jacob was a Baltic German and he ruled Latvians as an ethnically delineated class of indentured serfs. In current day Latvia, but also in the interwar period, that is between 1918 and 1940, a number of Latvians embraced Duke Jacob with his fleet and with his colonies as a proud moment in Latvian history and saw traces of Latvian presence in Tobago and Gambia. And here you just see that the naming places of Tobago and Latvia it was very common. There appeared all kinds of uh, cafes and institutions, which is, I think that's a, a casino actually named Tobago. Edgars Andersson, a Latvian historian who lived and wrote in post-World War II exile in the United States, wrote a dissertation and several books on this, reading ship records for Latvian presence among the Duke's ship crews. He had quite a few enthusiastic followers. For example, in Los Angeles, I met Janis, who had traveled to Gambia as part of an African-American heritage tour to look for traces for Latvians. He initially told his tour mates that he was simply interested in history, but the extra layers of his intentions came out when he pulled out the flag of the Duchy's warships at the former colonial fort in Gambia. For those following in Andersson's footsteps, the fact that Latvians were indentured serfs enabled the double move of, on the one hand, claiming historical presence via participation in colonial pursuits, and, on the other hand, establishing distance from responsibility for colonialism and slave trade, as it was both the Germans who had engaged in it. Outside observers, including journalists, scholars, and liberally inclined Europeans, tend to be puzzled by this. Why would anyone make a claim to Europeanness vis-a-vis -a, -vis a colonial past from which liberal Europe wants to distance itself? 
They provide various explanations, post-colonial nation building, post-Soviet compensation, and more. But what I'm more interested is in the, in the, in the encounter between Latvians aspiring to join Europe by claiming to have a colonial history and liberal Europeans who are puzzled by these claims and feel the need to explain and to occasionally mock them. One possible explanation comes forth from post-colonial scholars who might say, um, see, aspiring Europeans understand the constitutive role of colonialism for liberal Europe. You liberals wish to emphasize human rights and democracy, but they see through your ruse, they see colonialism made Europe what it is. But Latvians, in a way, fail the post-colonial test as well, because instead of exhibiting shame and condemning Europe's colonial past, they seem to actually take pride in it. And they somehow don't seem to understand that within this moral landscape, becoming European entails learning to inhabit Europe's colonial past through continued reflection on contemporary racism, their histories, and their legacies. Um, so it becomes this, when it's actually in the context of the migration, again, the migration crisis, uh, those who uh, oppose taking in uh, refugees as part of the sharing the burden arrangements used the argument that Latvia has nothing to do with, with Europe's colonialism and colonialism has to do with this sort of this way of migration and on the other hand actually then taking pride in these sort of uh, uh, seemingly colonial moments in, in European history. Um, to conclude then, it might be said that the actually existing post-Cold War liberalism, at least in Latvia, did become an ideology of power, unable to develop critical insights about itself, even as it demanded critical thinking from everyone else. In a post-Cold War a world, it was confident that it was the winning ideology, and it used law, institutions, and standardized modes of knowledge production, such as Europe-wide questionnaires about whom people would like to live with, to produce knowledge and to affect change. And the way this liberalism genealogy, as it was imagined in post-Cold War Eastern Europe, included European institutional and legal frameworks, international conventions, standardized sociological tools, and a few intellectuals who could be claimed as both local and liberal. For example, Isai Berlin became popular among my interlocutors, for he was born in Riga, and thus Latvians could claim a relationship with liberalism's intellectual tradition. So this is, they kind of tried to counter Isai Berlin to Duke Jacob. In other words, this was a fragmented genealogy that was quite different from how one would trace genealogy of a particular, uh, particular strands of liberal thought. It included a lot of bureaucratic instruments in addition to a few thinkers. And this too makes the object of my analysis different from liberal theory and liberalism as an intellectual tradition. As a result, the practices of tolerance promoters and other propon proponents of, of uh, liberalism came to resemble I would say the late Soviet socialist condition of hypernormalization described by Alexei Yurchak, whereby, and I quote him, it was more meaningful to participate in the performative reproduction of the precise forms of authoritative discourse than to concern uh, oneself with what they might mean in a literal sense, end quote. Moreover, the combination of geopolitics, the history that never ended, and the confidence of post-Cold War liberalism, the belief that history had ended, produced a discursive impasse in Latvia and, and, and in Central Eastern European, uh, you know, more broadly, whereby it was nearly impossible to criticize institutional, institutionalized forms of political liberalism and post-Cold War power configurations without risking association with right-wing nationalism or Putin's illiberalism. The result is that self-proclaimed liberals stopped paying attention to liberalism's internal contradictions and foreclosed possibility uh, on critical reflection upon it. Today, liberal democracy is thought to be threatened by populism, terrorism, and Russia. In the Latvian context, one of these external threats appears more potent than others, uh, especially uh, because what elsewhere is right-wing populism in Latvia is actually part of the political establishment. And that potent threat is, of course, Russia. It is hard to deny that the threat of Russia is useful for both what is referred to as the international liberal order and for Latvia with its own brand of nationalism and its own paradox of Europeanness. In Latvia, the threat of Russia currently allows nationalists in power to align with the international liberal order and to emerge as defenders of liberalism on its easternmost frontier, and it allows tolerance workers those who recognize and claim themselves to be liberals, to be nationalists in relation to Latvia's Russian-speaking population, whom they consider to be Putin sympathizers. In some, both tolerant workers and their opponents 
can claim to be liberal. Tolerance workers in relation to their compatriots' attitudes towards Europe's others, and nationalists in relation to Russia as an enemy of the international liberal order. The fact that liberal identification works for both is telling, I think, with regard to post-Cold War liberalism. Becoming liberal after the Cold War, it seems, means conscription into a geopolitical and ideological order that is just as much about us and them as its 20th century rivals, socialism and nationalism. Thank you. Much for this talk. We have plenty of time for questions, and I think I'll let lots of um, yeah. field throw our questions. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Jane, you go ahead. Okay. Oh, well, thank you for this really fascinating talk. I couldn't be more sympathetic to the um, missionary qualities of uh, Western European toward uh, Eastern Europe. Um, I want, want to ask a question about uh, the moment, uh, a particular moment in the history of liberalism. Because after all, the ism mm -hmm. is a problem. Mm -hmm. We don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what socialism was. Yeah. We didn't know what communism was. And so it's a kind of a moving target. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the problems in our academic discussion is to treat it as a thing that mm -hmm. does something. But it seems to me that what you're doing, breaking that down, is, is profound. Um, but it seems to me that I identify a particular moment of uh, liberal, um, uh, of this assertion of, of liberalism. And that's a moment in which, among American and European uh, academics, activists, sociologists, mm -hmm. goodwill people, um, uh, there was identity politics. It was a moment of identity politics. Mm -hmm and an, a moment of post-colonial studies. You addressed that in the, in the last mm -hmm. part of the talk. But what I mean by identity politics was that this emphasis on groupism, groups and minority rights, mm -hmm. with a particular role in politics, seems to me to be something that was not the case in terms of liberal thought you know, earlier, earlier in the 20th century. We're talking about the 1990s to 2000s, in which this has become, you know, the way you talk about identity. Mm -hmm. It might be one of the worst terms that we, we use in our vocabulary. But um, your discussion may be, and my questions really are about this moment, mm -hmm. this particular moment in um, assertion, which happens to hit after 19, mm -hmm. 18, 1989, 1991. And it was particularly touching to hear this story about the Tatars in um, Latvia, uh, because I think about uh, the Tatars I know in Tatarstan. And here I think we see a good uh, kind of way to start thinking about how this identity politics actually works extremely differently in the real post-Soviet mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. and in the minds of our goodwill mm -hmm. Taiwanese workers. Um, in Tatarstan, uh, in the 1990s and up till today. Mm -hmm. In fact, the whole point has been to include people of multiple ethnicities mm -hmm. in the Tatar project. Mm -hmm. It was a point of great pride in 2008-10 uh, to show that people in the city would say, I'm a Tatar, but in fact those people could have been mm -hmm. of any nationality. Mm -hmm. And when you contrast that, with, so that's one kind of, I, want to, I don't want to call that identity politics, Western mm -hmm. style. That is Russian, Soviet, mm -hmm. and selected notions of difference mm -hmm. where it is a fact of life. And it's not a statement about how you behave in politics. Although political leaders can include these different groups. And there seems to be a stark contrast between that kind of uh, recognition of difference and the politics of difference that our identity work, identity politics workers impose on other mm -hmm. people. Yeah. So it just. Uh, yeah. I think it's, it's exactly. I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I I was just thinking the other day about how I, I struggle often in in, um, in in the kind of question and answer sessions. On the one hand, 
because I'm trying to take it apart in these building blocks, what people actually do when they say that they're liberal in relation to those who are illiberal. But I'm often asked to kind of, well, so what are the distinguishing elements of this thing that we might think of as post cold War liberalism? And, and I, uh, I was actually thinking about it the other day that one good juxtaposition to make with earlier historical moments is that um, if kind of late 19th century, early 20th century, it was the liberals who were exclusionary. They were the ones who were sort of excluding various sort of immature political subjects from the demos and where so liberalism had to democratize itself in a way, then interestingly, today's uh, tolerance workers are accusing the masses of exclusionary behavior. So then it, it is that they have become kind of the, uh, the policemen of, of inclusion in some sense. And so in a way, it seems like uh, while actually in parallel, and I didn't talk about that as much, neoliberalism is going strong. So the social yeah. justice claims have been brought over to the identity politics realm, where indeed political claims are made through these identity categories. Um, and you see that very strongly in, in, in the places where you know the lessons are being kind of unrolled very intensively, because that is the first thing that people had to learn, right? how to actually either make claims themselves through these categories, I had a colleague, um, uh, Alexander Belyai, who wrote a whole dissertation about Russian youth political uh, organizations who were so critical of identity politics, who thought of politics as a practice, but realized that in the kind of changing political landscape, the only way they could get to practice politics, the only way that they could get elected, was to actually make claims through the Russian category as a minority category. So it was, I think, it's precisely that moment, and that's the distinguishing feature, that that's kind of the claims are made through these collective categories. Yeah, I think Thanks very much. It was a fascinating talk. I mean, it was, a, a, I was really impressed the way the categories were engaged, but, um, uh, not just taking apart, but trying to see if they could ever move back together. And, if, and I kind of understand um, so if, there, if there are two arguments I could take out from it, among many others, I'm wondering if the following would make sense to you. Um, so the first one is that um, I mean, the, the, the immediate argument is that this kind of liberalism, uh, this brand of liberalism, because there could be others, but this is the one, right, um, has been uh, delivered in such a way that it's not really open for discussion, it's not really a template for understanding oneself, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily even internally coherent or logical, uh, but is delivered unidirectionally as a dogma. Mm -hmm. right? And in this sense, um, it, it makes for problems that cannot be solved. It doesn't have a lot of solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, would that be Indeed. I mean, it them? didn't really yeah. allow for sort of discussion about, OK, if we're going to, to kind of mount campaigns against racism, what is it? Mm. What are we actually um, doing? And um, it, it really kind of, the, the, the people that I worked with at the time, I mean, they really became this sort of uh, ideological the cell, right? When they would sort of form themselves as this community of understanding and share dis what they understood to be disgusting stories of intolerant instances of all kind, and started to describe their opponents in these kind of almost physically repulsive terms. So it was a very, they felt like they were the missionaries against, uh, I mean, this was also a very, I think, specific sort of moment. Um, when it was, uh, when they felt so confident mm -hmm. that they didn't have to justify what they were doing. They just have to turn, they just had to make people think correctly. I think now with the kind of, um, with changing political landscape in Europe, there, there's a bit more kind of attention to maybe actually how to argue mm -hmm. what one needs to do. That there's actually, I would say, a politicization of what was an, almost like a technocratic project mm -hmm. of, of total social transformation. So, so, I mean, what are the consequences of sort of the active process of, um, of making somebody illegitimate, right? Meaning sort of, if you don't agree with these particular parameters, then you're suffering illegitimate. Uh, what was Hillary Clinton's term for? Uh, Basket of deplorables. Sort of deplorables, right. I mean, so that, there's that kind of rhetoric, right? Meaning they, they just cannot be reasoned about, right? There's that active one. But then there's the passive one. In the beginning of your talk, you uncouple liberalism from neoliberalism. And I can see why. Yeah. I mean, because I see the best. Uh, current liberal ideologies ask us to do precisely that, right? Mm -hmm. I wish to say, um, by saying that the issue is this kind of, uh, sort of civil rights, uh, 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 ethical, uh, ethical propositions, that it uncouples political liberalism from forms of economic liberalism. 
So it has the effect, in other words, of drawing attention to this to the exclusion of the other issues, mm -hmm. right? Meaning the economic consequences of something which is actually related. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of economic neoliberalism is connected, I think, to the first one in the sense that both of them are about individual liberties, about being left alone, uh, which could mean, for example, I shouldn't be taxed because uh, I want to keep a million and it's mine, right? Sort of, and that's my freedom. Well, that's the thing. I think that the political uh, strand actually is no longer about individual liberties. It is about collective rights. Um, and that's kind of, I think, that's the kind of one of the novel elements. And so, um, but it is uh, striking to what extent economic policy has been removed from political conversation. I think in Lofi, but I think beyond as well. That there is just, there's no party that is offering any, any alternative. And that it is almost kind of taken to be a naturalized uh, terrain. I think higher. I think proposed that as one of the solutions, right? That you kind of have to separate the two and remove economic policy from politics, right? And in that, in a sense, it's, it's striking to what extent that has actually happened in, in some of these places. That nobody is, is doubting the. But is there a concern also with like individual rights, but only civil rights, or individual mm -hmm. rights, but only individual privacies? Um, is, is that still part of the conversation? You think? You mean in in in, in general in public sphere? Yeah. Um. The right to be forgotten, uh, you know, those kinds of issues in the European Union. Yeah, yeah and I mean, there is some, but I mean, when at this, at this, um, mm -hmm. at the time, yeah, it wasn't really that prominent. I mean, as long as you sort of the economic, the, the, those were all sort of. Uh, I mean, there was some, there were some European Union funded projects about prisoners and detention and sort of, sort of individual rights that were not linked to identity. Um, and there were legislation was changed, so you could sue someone for <laughs> for offending um, or for uh, t uh, offending you. Um, but it was really the focus really was on this more um, category based claims. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Please. Um. Well, look, I so enjoyed this tour, and uh, for anyone who hasn't read the book, the book's really great. I, I want to share. Um, I wanted to ask kind of two separate questions, and either I don't, though I always think that's greedy, it should be one question per person, so you should just take one. If you want. The first is, uh, you may not have a lot of competition in the room uh, for the anthology here, but, but I, I just wanted, I was so curious as you were speaking that I don't really know much about Rather than just where we're all starting, of course, which are the concepts in the history of liberalism, and I kept thinking of Stephen Colliger's book of giving yeah. us a kind of a genealogy of neoliberalism, exactly, the Soviet yeah. thought. Yeah. You know, one could go down that route. But I, I realized I know nothing about the Latvian uh, the, the philosophical, linguistic landscape for using this term. Is it mm -hmm. simply some rendition of uh, that we would recognize? as in the Russian, or would it be something that it is really quite different? Well, that tradition is being written right now. <laughs> I mean, actually, people are... Um, that was, People get their words from somewhere, so are yeah, they using words that aren't really about liberalism? Well, when they use wor to. words, uh, you mean liberalism itself or related terms? When people talk about the terms that you're giving us in yeah. this thing. What yeah. are they... Is it... Well, they use... They don't, for example, with tolerance, they use um, and, and which which is, is not a political virtue, but a social virtue all the way through. And then for the kind of these projects that I'm describing, tolerance appeared as a as a word in, in Latvian as well. It was used alongside Yetsiatib to precisely mark this difference. Um, in the, I mean, there are thinkers or, or politicians rather that um, you know, one would sort of construe as part of something that might be called a local liberal, I don't know if I would call it a tradition, if, and if that's what your question sort of drives towards. But they, those were often Baltic Germans in the interwar period, right, between the kind of the World War I and World War II. So those are currently being, some of these figures are currently being recovered by, 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 by historians of ideas. Um, although I have to say that kind of research it doesn't take that. There's not that much that kind of research. Um, I, I I was very I was looking for it very intensively. But the way that the funding actually structures are organized for for research in Latvia, it gets directed in very particular directions, and that wasn't necessarily one of them. But there is a kind of papers um, 
Schumann's, you know, which was a Baltic German who was a figure that was kind of re 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 revived to, to kind of construe a local tradition. But it is, uh, as most, you know, as most, I suppose, it would be that some people who didn't think of themselves as liberals might be thought of as liberal because they exposed certain views but didn't call themselves such and vice versa. So just as everywhere else, I would say it's a very kind of diverse set of, diverse set of, uh, um, uh, dispositions, that there's no coherent kind of Latvian liberal tradition. Well, I guess all I'm saying, and we, we yeah. don't have to do this now, but I just mean, I really would, I don't want you to rush too quickly to make these terms available to non uh, yeah. the, the audiences, because I think we lose something along the way when we real, when we want to yeah. appreciate, you know, you know, you can hit certain, tr certain tr rigors, right? And you've already told us something, which is that they're not using Tolerantness or something, mm -hmm. some Russophone version. Yeah, there's a chip in it. Then there's no point in going down Wendy Brown rabbit hole about you know yeah. politics of aversion and yeah. all that because they're not using the yeah. word, right? No, no, I mean, so well, they're using both. So they're right? using something with yeah. different baggage. Well, they're using both, and they're but they're using something which has a different lineage, a different baggage, a different set of associations, a different. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's really yeah. Interesting. No, no, exactly. I mean, when when I was talking about the kind of people who were not sure what to do with tolerance because they thought it was social virtue, so in those occasions they would be using yetsiyatli, and then but they would sort of switch to tolerance exactly when talking about this political project. So in in a way, actually, for this for outlining the kind of the the contours of this political liberalism, it does make sense to use tolerance. But it would be a, a if I would expand beyond this to trace, you know, what the, the, the ways of thinking were, then that's exactly, yeah, then I would use that. Thanks. So. Uh, yeah. It, and, and, and you both, like, sorry, I don't know your name. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I look forward to reading the book. <laughs> it's still on my list. Uh, thank you for this really generative talk. And, um, and it brought a lot of very similar parallel processes that happened in the neighboring Ukraine as well. Um, but I was wondering about uh, if, if there are ways to think about it in terms of affect and emotion, how much tolerance is about hate and it's very kind of embodied experience, and what, um, what role all of this kind of affected part plays in, in the bigger view of, of, of what it happens, what does it feel to be a liberal? Uh, in the context, being battled. <laughs> so yeah. exactly. So I wonder what what's the role of the emotion in this narrative of understanding your know, liberalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, it ran through everyone's uh, talk and, and behavior. Um, let me begin with the distinction again between the social and, and political dimensions of of of, of yet to be more tolerant. So when. Uh, <coughs> when some of the kind of the teachers that were being taught to be tolerant uh, questioned it and described situations where it was actually intolerance uh, that could be understood as vir as virtue because that meant sort of rising up against injustice and they would describe kind of uh, uh, occasions where you know you get on a bus and um, a small child is being i don't know squished in a corner by some I don't know, you know, socially unaware people, and then you kind of defend that child, and that's a moment where you, you know, passionately sort of stand for social justice. So they thought of it as a kind of impassioned stance, tolerance, right? So that they're a public in kind of form of, of affect. Um, but there was a lot of uh, accusation on the part of my interlocutors uh, that that the intolerant subjects were emotional, right? They were passionately attached to the nation and then they couldn't kind of distance themselves and become more reasonable and that's a very common trope. Um, but of course they themselves are incredibly passionate in the way that they described, as I mentioned briefly, also their opponents and they would kind of, dis they, they, they kind of, the affect was disgust, repulsion, often in some kind of very specific political encounters, especially arguments around the pride parade. Um, both sides were, were quite uh, explicitly repulsed by each other, the, the, the tolerance workers by the, by the intolerance that they encountered, and they would describe their opponents physically, you know, how they were just ugly. And I mean, it was very striking. There could be a whole paper written about that, and you're absolutely right, but I don't particularly go into, into detail about that. 
another comment short without yeah. having to answer because I it, what struck me too is that uh, the kind of species of uh, liberalism mm -hmm. that operates in, in that space is um, is 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 very is filled with civic republicanism as another form of citizenship mm -hmm. that, uh, in, that is based on virtues in the language of virtues. Mm -hmm. And duties instead of rights. Right. So, so that to me strikes that some it's in, that the Baltics or mm. East Europeans are asked to be kind of civic republicans, while the European project is very liberal. Mm -hmm. in sense. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, yes, but also there are various strands within again, within liberal thought, and the ones that kind of uh, would actually do, do entail uh, remaking people uh, morally so that they would be good liberal subjects and could actually take up some of these rights and freedoms. So I, I wouldn't, I suppose, distinguish it entirely, but I, yeah, that's interesting. It would need to be kind of thought about in, in greater depth, but I wouldn't say that that kind of request to be um, ethically remade is, is, is not to live, not part of that liberals, right? I wouldn't kind of still think of it as, as distinct. But um, yeah, I'll think about that. Thanks. Um, thanks for the talk. It's really great, and I look forward to um, reading the book. I have a question that's kind of following up on Yanni's question. Mm -hmm. um, in your ethnographic work with the, your, the tolerance workers, did you um, did you witness people or experience people um, siloing off uh, the economy as it was, as it were, like the economic issues from issues of tolerance and participation in the public sphere, say? Or were there some people you worked with where there was some kind of uh, understanding of embeddedness? No, they absolutely had nothing <laughs> to do with them. I mean, they might, uh, might have part. Uh, participated in some kind of anti-corruption demonstrations, mm -hmm. uh, which as my colleagues, political scientists in Latvia have argued is another way in which to take to the economic policy of the, of the sure. table, right? To say that all we need to do is remove corrupt politicians in office rather than look at the economic policy offered by the competitors. In fact, there was a um, demonstration in 2009, huge mm -hmm. demonstration that started out as an anti-austerity uh, demonstration that was uh, co-opted by a political force called Other Politics uh, as an uh, that turned it into an anti-corruption mm -hmm. protest and actually then that political force was uh, elected uh, and the leader of that was Valdis Dombrovskis who was basically one of the kind of the, the leaders of the fiscal austerity measures and now actually is one of the European Union uh, I think commissioners for current for finance some kind of I can't remember the title, but it's actually very interesting also because <laughs> the person who was leading uh, the tolerance promotion efforts as the Minister of Integration at the time I was doing fieldwork later became the European Council's Human Rights Commissioner. And so it's just the kind of the, 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 the trajectories of some of these officials are also very interesting. But yeah, this question about the Latvian diaspora and whether or not Latvians who weren't in Latvia participated in this process in any way, um, and if so, what was their role? Uh, a lot of them were among the tolerance workers. Uh -huh. um, I think it was, uh, and I write a, a, a bit about this, is about kind of how n knowledge was understood, and who knew what? How that was understood in the sort of in the, in the 90s and throughout the 2000s, and and it certainly was the case that this um, returning diaspora, but not the actual people who left or the sort of first generation diaspora, but again the second sort of generation people who were actually uh, around 20 when um, the Soviet Union collapsed, but who'd grown up with a very powerful sense of you know having to go back and do something for the nation. They actually staffed a lot of the. Uh, a lot of these organizations, precisely because of their Western education, their ability to kind of navigate both worlds, often just because of English language skills. So they were actually part of a lot of these institutions. 
and faced an interesting uh, dilemma because they were very uh, uh, were raised as 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 ardent Latvian nationalists, but also as Western liberals. And so then, when they got to Latvia, actually another issue that in their kind of discourse was taken off the agenda was Russian speakers. And, and actually, tolerance discourses didn't pertain that much to Russian speakers uh, because of this kind of uh, understanding that, well, this was a different group of people that were actually making claims for the state. And, and integration was the word used for, um, for thinking about the relationship between Russians and, and, and Latvians. So they did play a very... Um, very powerful role, and some of them, you know, because of their sort of experience of having grown up in the West, would say things to me like, one person was of Swedish um, background, and she would say, you know, when I was growing up in Sweden, you know, there were no seat belts, there were no, uh, I don't know, publicly recognized something or other, there were people who were not as tolerant. Now it's all changed, you know, it's great, and Latvia is, of course, going in that direction, it's just a matter of time. And that was really a prevailing way of of thinking. I actually have one, one more question, um, if I may, and that is, could you talk a little bit about your new project, the Emptiness Project, and if you want to, you could talk about how it comes out of, out of this work and just where you see it going. Um, well, I, the, the, the project I did after this one had to do with emigration, partly because the border guards told me that this was <laughs> not only, but, but really because as, as at the time when a lot of uh, political attention was, or at least among the liberals, was on immigration and on opening borders and trying to sort of become this open and inclusive society, Latvians were leaving um, in great numbers to work in the UK and elsewhere. Um, and the initial estimates, you know, in, when I started the second project in 2010, was 10% of the population had left. But it, overall, actually, uh, since since 1990, uh, Latvia has lost about one third of its population, actually going going both ways. And this is similar for other neighboring states as well. So that became of interest to me, and I did a second project on on what this looks like in places from which people leave. So what does emigration look like from places which people leave? And then also followed them to Boston, Lincolnshire, and the UK to see what happens in those places in which they arrive. And I kind of came upon this, you know, emptying on the one uh, hand and filling up on the other. And in the case of Boston, Lincolnshire, the foreign-born population uh, increased by 450% in the time period of 10 years, and Boston became Britain's Brexit capital, so 75% people voted for Brexit. So my, I'm currently sort of writing a, a, a book that looks at this kind of relationship between these two places and the movement um, uh, within. And that, that really got me interested in the way that people talked about uh, their lives and their places uh, of living becoming empty. They described it as emptiness. and. That meant a very specific way of living that reconfigured social relations, you know, how you lived emptiness, how you managed it, how you managed the fact that you know 90% of homes in the village are empty. That is a different mode of living than 10 years ago. And uh, buses, bus roads are being cancelled, schools are being closed, villages are taken off the map, um, and people describe it as a kind of an apocalypse almost. So I got very interested in emptiness as, on the one hand, this kind of way of of, of uh, meaning making, so how do you kind of imagine what's happening to you vis-a-vis -vis mod modern modern jokes of emptiness as that which exists before civilization or comes after, but on the other hand, these very concrete practices of, of new ways of living that it entails, um, and that's and again that's a phenomenon that I think you know in Romania, Bulgaria, Lithuania, I mean Russia, vast areas. Um, I, I, I talked with some geographers in Russia, so. I'm sort of, on the one hand, looking at an emerging form of life, I suppose, and its specific contours, and on the other hand, you know, what, what actually that means as a, as a kind of reconfiguring, I suppose, um, political and economic power, you know, what, what can we say about well, how do these places actually come about, what is done, or if anything, and who thinks something should be done. Um, and yeah, so that's my kind of... Thank you very much. You could say that, in a way, that, that the discourse became emptied of meaning the liberal kind of discourse, and now I've turned to actual... <laughs> the space that was not. Right. 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 Right.
Thanks. Well, thank you very much for this very stimulating talk. And thank, thank you for you. coming.